Hey, International Poetry Circle. <laughs> we have an extra special treat for you today. <laughs> Check out who I'm with in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I am with the famous rock star poem reciting sock puppet, Claude the Reciter. Claude, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for being here with me. I was, I was so excited when you accepted my invitation. <laughs> this is well, I'm speechless. I'm speechless. What am I doing here? <laughs> you you are, know, yeah. It's it's like the Talking Head song, "Once in a Lifetime." How did I get here? <laughs> well, you're the only poem reciting uh, sock puppet in the world, I think, and you read really well. So, oh. can you? A lot of people know who you are. You appeared uh, on Twitter, I think, at the end of March reading poems and you've been reading a poem a day yeah can you tell us a little about yourself okay well i don't remember how old i am um my friend tony made me out of a discarded rag sock actually it was never worn i think that's important to point out and i'll tell you a little bit about my anatomy so i consist of a sock a let's see some felt <laughs> And my upper and lower palate are made out of, I think, a Greek yogurt container um, to give a little structure. And I got a tuft of hair on top. And the glasses, I'm pretty sure, came out of a treasure chest in a dentist's office. <laughs> a dentist got, that Tony knows or doesn't know? Um, I, I believe it was Tony's kid's dentist. <laughs> and the hostels, which are a little fuzzy. Uh, I'm beginning to show my age. Uh, it was pointed out to me that when I wrote, uh, when I read uh, Wilfred Owen's poem yesterday, Dulce et decorum est, that there were pills of my own fuzz in my mouth. So I've, I'm practicing a little hygiene and I think I've, I've cleaned up pretty well for you. Oh, you look great, but also it's quarantine time. I mean, we're all looking kind of funny these days. You look fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so I don't remember how old I am, but Tony made me to entertain his children. And I gotta say that um, I have lived a very quiet life. Without question, the last month of my life has packed in much more experience than anything I'd had up till now. Yeah, you're on Twitter, you're on Facebook, you're online every day, and you're getting fans, just so you know. I'm touched. <laughs> I am. So how did you make the change from entertaining Tony's kids to reciting poetry online? Well, Tony likes poems, and he loves Jabberwocky. Okay, that's really the starting point. And I think that Tony, some, for some reason, connects Lewis Carroll's sense of whimsy with the sort of animating spirit that went into making me. And what happened was, Tony was watching some of his friends on Twitter reciting poems, um, and decided that he wanted to get involved, but maybe was a little camera shy. And so the connection with me just sort of leaped into his head and he suited up with me, so to speak, and read Jabberwocky, um, which, as I said, is really his favorite because, and I think that there's a lesson here in a way for appreciating poetry generally, it's a nonsense poem that makes absolutely perfect sense and everybody understands it. I like think, life. <laughs> yes, like life. It's not comprehensible, but it's perfectly comprehensible. And it's just, uh, it's just really his favorite. Well, I'm so happy you appeared uh, reading that poem. And you've returned every single day since, at least starting in April, right? That's right. And you're taking requests. I know this because early on, I wrote to you and asked if you would read Elizabeth Bishop's One Art, and you said yes, and then you did it. And I think you even did it on Tony's birthday. That is correct. Tony's birthday was April 5th. I think that was the day when 
you requested that poem. That's when we knew that we were some in some way hitting the really big time. And <laughs> Aww. I got a little bit nervous because you asked for a reading of that poem, which is one that Tony knew already and loved and had great, great affection for. And you had also suggested that maybe it would be a good idea to add captions for, for, to make it a little bit more broadly accessible to more people. And so we decided to try all that. And it just felt like a real leap into the dark Mm-hmm. just a leap into thin air to, for me the sock puppet to recite this gorgeous powerful poem at your request for the whole world it <laughs> felt like a completely ridiculous and absurd thing to do <laughs> then we were completely amazed because people loved it and they thanked us for doing it and it, it somehow seemed to work and we still don't, under, don't understand why. Yeah, it, it's incredible. Um, w- when you read One Art, uh, I was so excited. And I sent your video to my dear friend Lloyd Schwartz. And we had a whole conversation about how well you read that poem, a serious conversation about wow. this sock puppet reading Bishop so well. <laughs> and actually, Um, That video was sent to some other poets, and it ended up in a class, a bishop class. Wow. (laughs) That's, that's, that's just, that's wild. (laughs) Yeah, it's amazing. And yes, life is surprising. I was on the phone with my friend yesterday, and she said, "Um, so I'm working on this editing project. Um, What are you, what are you doing? What are you getting ready to do? And I said, I'm getting ready to interview a sock puppet. And she goes, what? (laughs) And I said, yeah, this is where life is at right now. I'm interviewing a rock star sock puppet who read Bishop to all of us. (laughs) So now that you are so out there in the public uh, reading poetry, uh, this is one of the most important things to me, getting poetry in the public, because honestly, I think everybody likes poetry. Kids love it. At some point, Many people get intimidated by it. I think it happens in school most of the time. And a lot of people, usually by the time they're adults, they say, ah, I don't get poetry. It's not for me. To me, it's just storytelling. And I think people have to find the right poem. Now, what, what would you say to people who say, I don't get poetry, poetry's not for me? I say, look for the story. I wanna talk about Jabberwocky again. That's a great example because it's uh, it's a hero story. Everybody knows hero stories about the uh, the adventurer, the dragon slayer, the 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 hero w- tasked with the you know all important quest, and who rushes out and completes the quest and returns home and is changed. It's as old a story as there is. It's the epic of Gilgamesh. Listen to me talking about Gilgamesh. What do I know? I'm a soft puppet. And I'm listening to you talk about Gilgamesh. <laughs> but there you go. So there's a, there's a story that, that I, th- I think most of us just intuitively understand. But then when it's presented in that poem with that music, with the, the, the music of it, the, the, the tempo, the way the words kind of come in a pattern. And even though the words are mostly just gibberish words, you can pronounce them and hear them, and it all just works magically. So what I think about it is that you, if, okay, what do I think about it? I'm working, I'm working out my thoughts. I think that for most of us, we do better if we don't worry so much about whether we're missing little details here and there, Maybe there are little things that are going on, like some words inside a a line that somehow hook up together in meaning, or maybe they have a similar sound, maybe they rhyme or they have other kinds of connections. Maybe we notice those things, maybe we don't, but they work their magic on our brains anyway. And I think that if people just don't worry too much about whether they're catching all the details as the words go by, then maybe that will help them to enjoy it a little bit better. And as you said, again, Jabberwocky shows this, 
the being open to the idea that a poem is telling a story, even if it tells the story in just capturing a picture, is just important to keep in mind. Keep your ears open for the story that's being told. Yeah, I think again, so it goes back to storytelling. What did you say? So I said that's that's a sock puppet's thought. So take them for what they're worth. <laughs> I'm curious, and I don't know if if he's right next to you or not, but I hear Tony's a librarian, and you know he loves poetry too. I wonder, can you ask Tony what he thinks about this? Sure. Do you have some thoughts you'd like to add? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna cede the, the stage to him for a minute. Is that okay? Sure, anything you want. Okay. Hi, Hi yes, I am a librarian. Um, and before that, I was a, a philosophy professor. Um, so what, one thing that I think about my own, my own kind of reaction to poetry and my own fascination with poetry is that I have um, over the years had a lot of this, the kind of trepidation that Claude was just describing about whether whether poetry is too complicated to grasp or whether it's almost like, like solving an intellectual puzzle. That is, whether the process of understanding a poem is, is a matter of getting, getting the techniques and understanding what kind of tricks are being played on you by the poet and, and all of the craft and artifice that goes into it. And for me, um, the prospect of, of of trying to understand a poem and all of the mechanics that go into a poem has been kind of intimidating. Um, and um, this, this in a way is, I think embodied in something that I sort of, sort of feel emotionally is right, which was Plato's critique of poetry in the Republic of all things, um, in which he criticizes the art of poetry as embodying a kind of witchcraft where the poet, by means of crafting imagery in language and sound, can interpose appearances, and for Plato, false appearances, um, between the hearer and reality, and thereby you know, obscure a true knowledge and understanding of the subject matter. So Plato in the Republic embodies and express, has Socrates express this great sort of skeptical doubt about the social usefulness and, benef and sort of beneficial aspects of the poetic craft. Um, because the, again, because it seems as though it embodies this, this, sort of, this sort of witchcraft that can bewitch people by means of language and divert them away from knowledge. And while I don't necessarily share the platonic attitude that, that poets bewitch us in, I mean, I suppose that as a craft, as, as an art or as, as, a, as a method of rhetoric and possibly persuasion, it can be put to maybe socially, um, socially questionable purposes. Um, but what I found myself um, to be sort of sympathetic in Plato's critique was this idea that poetry uses something that is so essential to our nature as creatures, which is language and language use. Um, I mean, we live through language. We uh, kind of our, our lives are lived through words, through stories, through language. And what the poet works in is precisely that medium that defines sort of something essential about who we are, and can use it in ways that, as I as I was saying, sort of in a magical sort of way, can can kind of bewitch us. And for that reason, I think I've always felt a little bit, a little bit, um, just a little bit removed emotionally from poems. And oddly enough, with the help of, of Claude here, um, I have just really, really found the process of reading poems to be tremendously helpful in getting me past a little bit of that, that, skept, that skepticism toward the art. Yeah, um, well, you said um, also that something about understanding in the beginning, the need to understand and at the other end of the spectrum, you have feeling. And what does language do? I love that I'm in a box right now because I also 
um, always talk about poetry being like an asymptote. And now I have, um, I have the X and Y. <laughs> yeah. So to me, poetry does essentially what language does, which is we are trying, you know, it's like, okay, you have language and you're using language. What a poem does is this, it's using language to constantly approach a, a given feeling but it doesn't quite meet it at any finite distance. Yeah. Um, and so I think focusing on the feeling um, instead of understanding uh, the secret meaning of this, which is under glass in a museum and it has to be interpreted this one way, which often the interpretations taught are, are not actually what poets think when they're writing them. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know what your early experience in school with poetry was like, but I unfortunately do have very strong memories of a kind of almost mechanistic approach to understanding poems. Like I just remember a little bit of the of the, the sort of the diagnostic language of metrical feet of, you know, the of, you know, an I am versus, you know, a troche or whatever it might be. Um, and I remember it being presented as as a highly technical art with a very specialized set of devices for its construction yeah and when you're a kid in school um it doesn't strike me necessarily as as the best way to present um to present this craft which is so basic i mean it's it doing things with words and finding the expressive potential in words is is right, it lies right next to our home as our you know in our nature as beings as language using creatures and so yeah, I mean, my early educational experience with it, I think, didn't necessarily set me off on the best path either. And yeah, I, I mean, I think this happens. I, I mean, all, all I remember was learning maybe one Shakespeare sonnet, and I didn't, I, I didn't understand it. So I felt like, and the language was so different. I thought, well, I, I don't get this, and I don't care about this, because uh, I don't know how to access it. And... Um, that, that's pretty much, oh, and I remember learning Chaucer uh, as an undergrad with um, the professor just tapping the table and I didn't feel anything and I, the language was different, I didn't feel anything. And also um, that's, that's, you know, we don't speak every other, it's not da -dun, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun. You can have oh shit and you can have holy shit. Yeah. So it's not just every other syllable. So, so yeah, I think it's just, you know, fo focusing again on the feeling. I want to test out an experiment uh, with Claude uh, okay. because Claude can't make facial expressions very many and definitely not with his eyes. So I want to read a poem to Claude that I always recite to people when they tell me they don't get poetry. Okay, I'll bring him back. Okay. <laughs> All right, ready? He's ready, okay. <laughs> okay, so Claude, I want to read you this poem. I know you like poetry, um, but this is a poem that I always tell people when, when they say, well, I don't really get poetry. I don't think it's for me. I, I don't understand it. Um, I hope I read it right. It's in my head. It's very short. It's like this big. It's by a wonderful poet, Andrea Cohen. I'm actually going to get up because I have the book right over here, and I want to advertise her book. Where is it? Where is it? Here it is. Okay. I have it in my head, but I'm going to show you the book. Okay. So it's Andrea Cohen. It's from her book called Furs Not Mine, Four-Way Books. It's called The Committee Weighs In. The Committee Weighs In. The Committee Weighs In. I tell my mother I've won the Nobel Prize. Again, she says, which discipline this time? It's a little game we play. I pretend I'm somebody. She pretends she isn't dead. Ooh. I knew you were going to drop that jaw. I knew it. So what usually happens is people start laughing a little bit at the beginning of this. And their eyes are lit up. Oh, this is so playful. And then in less than 30 seconds, you get that. Yeah. Yeah. So I know you don't have a lot of facial expression, but I was thinking your jaw just might drop and it did. And you weren't thinking about understanding the poem, were you? No. no. <laughs> wow. So 
Yeah, I know. It's it's like a it's a whoa kind of poem. It's like, a, like a sucker punch, like. <laughs> it's totally like a sucker punch. Um, yeah. Will you read us a poem next, please? I'd love to. I have two. Both of these were recommended by friends. One of them uh, by a friend on Twitter. Her name is Johanna, and she asked for me to read a poem by the Canadian poet Elizabeth Smart, and it's titled An Arrogant Snail. Here it is. An arrogant snail for purposes of his own, thought fit to cross the graveled road at his own majestic pace. And even if the cars flash past with a speed and fury far beyond birds of prey, so that he wouldn't even have time to withdraw into his frail shell, still, because they were so fast and he so slow, he might have been missed and his unwise policy justified. So there you go. Thank you very much. What made, so you, you got a request for that poem, right? I did, yes. Are you still taking requests for poems? Have you been getting a lot of requests? I am trying to fulfill all the requests I'm getting. And I got a little bit of a backlog. I'm probably good for at least a couple of weeks, actually. And I want to keep on doing this until Tony goes back to work. And we don't know when that will be, but until that happens, I mean, Tony, let me say, Tony works at home and all that stuff, but until he has to, you know, hoof it back over to the library building where he works, I will be reciting a poem every single day. Wonderful. <laughs> will you, you said you have two. Will you read us the I other do. one? So the other one was requested by Tony's friend Ellery, and she thought of this poem I'll have to, I'll, we'll, we'll have to reference contemporary events here a little bit. She thought of this poem shortly after election day in November of 2016, election day in the United States. And everybody knows what that day signified. And this was a poem that Ellery thought of on that occasion. It's by Max Ehrman and it's titled Washington DC 1924. <clears throat> Alternately, I bow my head in shame and burn with accusations on my tongue. Is this the land whose praises we have sung, that all the world know her unsullied name? Here sit the nation's counselors without aim, like lizards sunning on a heap of dung. Here crawls the grub worm with his paunch low swung, the sewer rat swells out his oily frame. Oh, millions at your daily task, awake. It's not enough to labor and to sleep. Let pens run hot and righteous voices shake the land until the evil fear and weep. Our happiness, our firesides are at stake when in our nation's house, the vermin a very timely poem. Thank you for reading that one. And thank you, Ellery, for asking for that poem. Um, I'm sure a lot of us are feeling that poem right now. Yeah. Um, I'm really glad that you are safe and well, Claude. Um, someone told me on Twitter recently, or I can't remember if it was a tweet to me or if it was just a tweet in response to you, uh, but I was definitely tagged in it, that you are the best thing that has come out of this dark, these dark times. <laughs> oh my um, and you've been an integral part of the International Poetry Circle um, these past five, six weeks. Uh, and I know that people are looking forward to your readings every day. And thank you so much for being here uh, as a part of this uh, International Poetry Circle community uh, daily. Um, Tara, it is an honor beyond telling. I just can't, I, I can't, I still can't really encompass it in my, you know, my rag cotton head that here I am, but I'm honored to be involved and I will keep reciting poems, certainly. Well, I hope you do. Do you have any specific plans for the future? Um, anything else you'd like to do with poetry or? I'm not really sure. I like to listen in particular to my friends in the world of elementary and high school education and school libraries. 
I, I, I know that my, my, um, my friend Tony's child here had mentioned to his classmates recently that his dad and his dad's sock puppet were recording poems. Maybe get involved with his class in some way. But that's, that's the sort of thing I'm, I'm thinking about right now. I'd like to take cues from educators. And if they think that Claude can help make poetry more fun for kids, that's, that's something I'm really excited about. So educators, if you have ideas uh, for Claude, or if um, you, you'd like to have Claude read, um, feel free to contact him. He's ragpoet, at R-A-G-G-P-O-E-T, ragpoet on Twitter. And I'm just so grateful that we're buddies now, Claude. Me too, Tara, me too. <laughs> Poetry really helps um, make connection and it's really helped to make uh, a lot of us all around the world connect during this really hard time. Uh, and I hope you and Tony and Tony's family stay safe and well and keep coming back for poems. And you can count on me to spread the word about you and your, uh, your reciting. And I think reading to kids in school is a fantastic idea. And I know this because right now you're reading for adults <laughs> and adults are loving it. And, um, Kids are, oh man, they might even love it. I don't think it's possible to love it any more than, than we adults do, but they will love it just as much. You're wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Tara. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and so we look forward to your poem tomorrow. Okay. It's the last day of National Poetry Month. That's right. And then we'll have to retire that hashtag, but yep. International Poetry Circle lives. International Poetry Circle is ongoing. So yes, thanks again, and um, I'll see you on Twitter. Okay, okay. signing off then. Bye. Bye.